G'day everyone and welcome to the final coaching module of the World Rugby High Performance Virtual Academy. My name is Matt Johnston and this week we'll be looking at performance analytics, more specifically how to make our analysis as practical as possible. For me, the role of the analyst is to simplify the complex. We take these huge amounts of information, we turn them into manageable chunks, which can be used by the coaches for a practical purpose and refine them even further into something that's easily consumed by the players. Professor Bill Girard is a bit of a godfather in performance analytics in rugby. Now he defines performance analytics as analysis with purpose and a practical application. For me, that means if you don't have a clear purpose of what you're looking for, you can waste a lot of time and potentially not come up with anything of value to your team. Just for those of you playing at home, we're not actually looking for Wally in this picture. We're looking for all the rugby balls. And here's a couple to get you started. So as I said, we're going to look at practical analysis and getting the most bang for our buck, no matter the resources that are available to us. And to do this, we're going to look at the time we have available. So looking at taking the time to build relationships, to look at those game trends or specific projects, work out how much time we can spend focusing on us or the opposition, and then how much time we can put into establishing the team identity and playing style and using that as the basis of our analysis. We'll also look at the tools that are available to us, both hardware and software, the external data sources that are out there, both free and the ones that you might have to reach into your pocket for, and how we can share that video and information, which leads us on to talking about transfer. Here we'll look at learning styles and the learning environment, and also presenting information effectively and getting it to stick for our players, both in their memory and on the training paddock. The first and most important part of time, or where I think we can get the most value, is in building relationships. Another quote from Bill Gerrard is, we can only make a real difference when coaches and analysts share an understanding of what is relevant and purposeful. So taking that time to get to know your staff and build those relationships for me is really key. Developing that open communication and trust gives you that real valuable input into your training and your game plans, that opening up and sharing of ideas and the benefits that can come from those expanded opinions. Next, we move on to the clarity of roles and the focus for each area. What do you want your analyst or your other staff to do in team meetings, in training especially? What communications do you want from them? What angles do you explicitly want filmed for each activity to give you the most a benefit in your feedback and review. And on match day, what are your communication protocols between your different staff? Are you lucky enough to have two sets of radios or do you not have any radios at all? If you have an analyst working with you, what do you want them to look for specifically rather than just getting a whole lot of generic data? If you don't have an analyst, how can you take notes or work out key moments in games? Is it up to you to write them down in a notebook? Or can you have your team manager talking with them as well and writing down key times in match play? And finally, knowing your team, both as individuals and a collective, knowing their strengths, knowing their learning styles, knowing their experience, especially with your systems. If they're brand new to your system, you have to spend more time getting them uh, comfortable and reviewing them within that system. Or if they do have experience, your analysis can then focus on tweaking it to meet the different opposition. And finally, also get to know the cohesion within the team. How confident are they to communicate and problem solve with each other? Just another little aspect where you can take the time to get really good rewards down the track. An element of our time where analysis can have a huge impact on our planning and direction is in game trends and practical projects. So using the numbers in those reports to get a really practical application on what we want to try and achieve. So for us now, I'll look at the Aussie Sevens example back in 2018 and some of the projects that came out of the game trends for us. So the first was an increase in ball and play. The implication for us 
was an increase in physical demands and an increase in general activity in the game. So more passes, more rucks. So the project for us was to work with the S&C staff and, the, and use our GPS data to identify uh, the game activity cycles and the worst case scenario in a game, how long the ball would be in play for and what our activity rates would be in those cycles. And then group all of our training activities based into that sort of activity output that we wanted to achieve. So the meters per minute, uh, the time duration, or the physical activities, the, the contacts or the passes that we wanted to achieve in those times. So that was really important in our planning. The next was around the restarts. So we knew that contestable restarts were going up, but actually regaining the ball was going down. So teams were getting better at it. The implication for us, the increased contest, and as I said, teams getting better at winning their receipt. The project for us, work with one of the co-coaches from AFL, uh, go through some footage with him, look at different techniques where we could exploit a weakness in the opposition or develop our own techniques to try and uh, shelter that ball that was being kicked to us a little bit more. Next for us, and this was a really big focus area, our attack completions, so our tries per 22 meter entry. We were only at 64%. We were bottom eight compared to the rest of the series. So the implication for us was the ability to convert lie breaks to execute under pressure. So we went about um, building in elements of our training uh, to make sure we had those pressure points, but then also working on other projects around our communication where we analysed some of our comms using some resources from the Australian Institute of Sport. I'll talk more about those if you're keen on it in the discussion calls later. Ruck retention, a huge one for us. The implication on that, our defensive ruck decision making. Do we compete and jackal for the ball? or do we go out, line up in the D-line and put some pressure on them with our line speed? We also knew that South Africa were the benchmark, being the world's best, winning 21% of the opposition ball. So we had a bit of work to do there and a few projects around our decision-making to look at. And with the source of tries, where they were coming from, the penalties, restarts and turnovers, the implication for us, our game plan, what were we were gonna do on penalties, how much transition training and unstructured training were we actually incorporating into our sessions and obviously looking at those restarts. So for us, they were some really practical projects we could do based on what the game trends were showing us. So time is a limited resource for our analysis. So we need to make the decision of how much do we spend looking at us and how much do we look at the opposition. For us, we used to focus mostly on ourselves but there were areas of the opposition that we tended to look for, no matter who they were. The first was building a profile, especially for us again around that restart with it being really important. So working out where they would probably go and what we would do to counteract that. Also looking at what a team looks like when they're winning. So some of those key metrics when they win, and what are some of those key metrics when they lose? And is there something there that we can target? We build up their scoring profile, probably more important for 15s. Are they a team that likes to build penalties or is it tries all the way? How do they use the ball, especially in their, their halves or their, their tens, their uh, kick pass run sort of breakdown as well, we can look at. Who are their key playmakers and talismans and is there, there anything we can do there to try and shut them down? How well do we know ourselves are we so confident in our system that we know it back to front that we can make those small adjustments moving forward to target the opposition? And finally, a great way to save time when looking at the opposition is just to watch the first 20 minutes of matches because we know there's no score implication generally in that time. So teams are gonna try and spend that first 20 minutes playing how they want to. So it's a good quick way for us to get some ideas. And this is the one that played a key role for us as we moved along. When we look at ourselves, what are we actually collecting and measuring on? If you have a team identity or a team culture, are they just words on a wall or are they the foundation of your identity and performance? Is it something that's coach driven or is it something that the players are bought into and really drive themselves? How do you measure it? And how do you feed back on it? Our example with the Aussie Sevens, we had three keywords, unrelenting, clinical, 
and united. So for us, all of our review was then focused on these three words, unrelenting, our backing game stats, our GPS numbers, how often and how much do we just keep going and going and going? So that was something that we looked at. Our clinical, based on the decision-making and the breakdown, based on our finishing in the 22, that was one of the metrics we used around our clinical. And then United, were we on the same page? Were we communicating the right things at the right time? Were we executing and were we supporting each other? So these words were more than just words on a wall. They became our feedback method for games and for training. And even with training, our players would give themselves a rating out of 10 for unrelenting, clinical and united. For me, that was a really key part and something which made a difference to our analysis, being able to target at who we were and that real clarity of knowing what we wanted to achieve. So for me, the identity creates the opportunities with branding, with a review and messaging, which we'll talk about later with getting that message to stick. The next element of practical analysis we look at is the tools available to us, no matter the size of our budget. So when it comes to training footage, what is it that you're actually looking for? What do you want to focus on and what do you want to feed back? Are you looking at the shape and pattern of your team or are you looking at skill and technique? So there's a couple of ways we can do that. Obviously drones are fantastic and we use those a lot when we could. Otherwise, if you're after close contact or even with your kicking drills, the phones and the iPads are just as good. If you're lucky enough to have the camera with a loop feedback, that's fantastic as well. In terms of game footage, knowing what you have access to, are you in a position where you're getting feed straight into your coach's box? Are your games broadcast where you can get access to them? Or more commonly, as we're seeing now, are they streamed? And are we able to get those that footage from those streamers too? So establishing what footage is available. If there's none available, then filming yourselves obviously too. But if there are broadcasters or streamers on site, building that relationship to try and get a copy of that footage post game is key as well. Now analysis software can be a huge chunk of our budget. It can take time to learn, and there can be different alternatives there too. If you're not in a position where you have analysis software, some of the video programs, so iMovie on Mac, is a great way of just cutting up clips to be able to share. It can take some time, but it can give you some really good benefits as well. And finally, the presentation software. What do you want to get across is my big message, and what time will it take to present something? So do you have access to Coach Paint, Clip Draw, or Canva. The Canva is a good little cheap one we'll talk about later on too. Or is it something that you can do yourselves with a screenshot or being really clear in the clips that you want to show? And the next part of tools, and this is where we can get some great benefits, is from external data and then the sharing of the footage. So what's available? If you're using analysis software, do you have access to external code like Opta if you're working at the international level? If you're looking at live game stats, again, if you've got budget, do you go with Opta? Or if you're working on an international game, sometimes ESPN Scrum or other websites will have live stats that you can tap into if you've got an internet feed. Now, World Rugby put together tournament reports and shape of the game reports. They can be a great way to start to develop an understanding of what's out there and how the game is being played. And finally, video reporting and sharing. Do you use Huddle? Are there alternatives like Box or Dropbox? Or if you don't have those elements set up, even just creating your WhatsApp teams and sharing key bits of information and footage that way can be one way to go. And finally, working on transfer. So those learning styles and those learning environments to make sure what we're trying to get across in our clips with our analysis, with our numbers and presentation actually takes effect. The players are learning and can transfer that onto the field. So the factors uh, impacting the learning process include the experience of us as the coach, experience of the players that we're working with, the subject that we're introducing, is it something that we've done before or is it something brand new? And the environment that we're working in, is it our own space or are we on tour? Are we constantly changing the, the places that we, we have to work in? Now, team space is fantastic 
if with a centralized program or a home ground, you get your team rooms and you can provide learning provocations and stimulations around there to build that identity. If you don't have that, how can you create those things virtually? Or when you're in a short campaign, how can you take those things with you? And I think one of the biggest things around learning styles, we are all different, but we all do learn in different ways, not just specific ways, even generationally, we're all different. So providing opportunities for players to observe, to trial things and make mistakes, to take notes, to visualize, to refer, rehearse, reflect, and to ask questions is key. So making sure that we're taking time to present information in different ways and giving people time to learn, I think is just as key. So making it stick, that transfer of information, making sure that we have clear messages with a practical application. Now I'd go back to that themes and identity for us, the unrelenting, the clinical and the united. Or looking at Paul Gustard's presentation, I thought this was a great graphic, knowing exactly what we wanted for our defense with the suffocate, the strangle and the squeeze. Now there'd be no reason why we couldn't use this as part of our review and put up our defensive numbers or our KPIs with that as well. That was a great little example, I thought. Moving on, how much information do we want to share and in what form? Are we looking at individuals? Are we looking at units? Are we looking at the whole team? With a clip or a screenshot or an image or a number, be just as effective. So knowing what it is that we want to try and get across. Is it a discovery meeting where they were taking lots of time and getting lots of input, asking questions and looking at a long clip where we might be trying to formulate new ideas? Or is it a clear directive meeting where we know what we want to achieve? We have clear and specific clips and clear and specific information that we want to get across. And ultimately those pump up videos too. They can just be feel good, but hopefully they're reinforcing some of those key messages that we want to get across. For us, this worked in, in two different ways. Uh, we had a really big buy-in one season uh, around Lone Survivor and the message of draw a line with that speaker of continuing to go on when things are hard. So everyone bought into that, it was big at the time. And then moving on, when the squad changed a little bit and those who enjoyed country music a bit more, there were certain country music songs that would even chuck in there with key messages. So again, know your players, know what's going to get through to them, and more importantly, know what images you want to share in those videos. And finally, what information are you wanting to get across at pre-game, half-time and a post-match? Are you targeting the individuals, the units, or the whole team? So again, are you giving guys and girls an opportunity to learn on their own, to learn as a group? giving clear visuals to the team to try and impact that message or using small clear reviews like a hot review when all you're focused on is those clear numbers. So a hot review is a great idea that New Zealand Netball had at the World Cup where they would address those key KPIs straight after the game so they, they could put it to bed and start working on the next thing. Whereas the cold review for them was the big review the next day. So just a couple of different ideas there on how you can share that information and make it available to your teams. Now the transfer of information from analyst to coach, what is it you're after? And hopefully you've built this relationship. So have a clear plan and understanding of what you need and what you're looking for and how you'll deliver it. Answer the key questions and show the key implications of the data that you're sharing. So as the analyst, anything you're giving should hopefully be able to be used as a coaching intervention or a learning tool for your player. Make sure it's been backed up by video, either as individual clips or kept as some sort of database. And as we showed with those uh, restart maps, show what is probable and possible. So we don't need to show a whole bunch of clips of the same thing. We can be really specific and give one example of what they'll probably do. If it's an example of South Africa here, but they kick to the same area each time. And be aware of confirmation bias. You might have a preset idea of what's happening, but we can really only take in about 40% of what we observe. So making sure that we're not trying to find information to back up our gut, but making sure that information is coming in and we're 
reacting to it in the right way. Finally, a great book, uh, Presenting Data Effectively, comes up with five ways uh, to communicate your findings for maximum impact. The first of that is to start at the end. What are the action items, the conclusions, the findings, the implications of the information you're trying to get across? I carefully consider your colour as well. It has a big difference on making sure uh, people react to it or can take it in. The amount of times that we've seen, say, yellow writing on a green background and people can't see what's going on. So just be aware of your colour. Language is key, that emotive language that we saw in, in Paul Gustard's defence one there. For us, that united, unrelenting and clinical. Finding words that resonate. And don't stay stuck in the past. If you're no longer using something, then don't present it. Don't waste that time. And becoming a numbers artist. What's going to make a difference? What's going to hit the head and the heart together? If you're presenting a key stat, like your uh, 22 metre try completion, if it's great, give it something. If it's poor, maybe show it uh, an instance where it hasn't gone right and put that number with it. And finally, the one page philosophy. This is something that we worked really hard on uh, in our last two seasons, making sure that our language was clear and all the messages had a practical example or a practical application. Our game previews and reviews were only the one page. So there's a little example there on the right hand side. Our team meetings were 20 minutes max, three slides, three points per slide, probably only half a dozen clips each time. And it was players presenting with a coach summarising. So if a player hit on all the details and the coach didn't have to add too much, then they wouldn't. And also questioning for understanding. Uh, so the photo from earlier with the cups on the floor, we always used to have a field mapped out on our team meeting room so our players could demonstrate uh, what we were talking about or the, the actions that we wanted to do on the field. And finally, we encouraged each of our players to have a notebook at every session so they could diagram, they could take notes, they could draw pictures, anything that would help them transfer that information across and really get it to stick for them. So summing it all up, making sure that our analysis has purpose and application. Take the time to build those relationships with your staff and the players. It can be really valuable in making sure you're getting the right messages across and really making the most of all of their skills. And choose the tools and the transfer that's right for you. No matter on your budget, there is an alternative out there. And finally, make it stick. Remember our analysis is about getting better and hopefully winning matches. So any information or analysis that we're doing, if it doesn't have a practical application out onto the paddock, we're probably wasting our time. So moving on to the calls later in the week, I want you to think about what it is that you currently use or how you use your analysis in your planning. How do you present and share that information with the players? And how can you actually measure and review if that uh, sharing and presenting is being effective. And finally, are there any gaps in your program that can be filled by developing those relationships or undertaking some targeted projects? That's it for me in this presentation. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out and I look forward to speaking to you later in the week. Thanks again.